My topic for this message is poetry and life and my 50-year experience of poetry. The reason I'm drawn to this topic at this particular point in my life is because Crossway Books just published the narrative poem, Esther, which I wrote as a gift to the church in 1987 when two-thirds of you were not alive, probably. Um, and then I went down to Crossway last week and on Thursday gave a chapel talk to the publisher in which I paid tribute to their willingness to publish books that don't sell, namely books of poetry. It's one of the sweet things when you have a relationship with the publisher and you have a few books that do sell, they'll let you publish some things that don't sell. And poetry is not read widely and it's been so much a part of my life that I want to talk about it because I thought it might be helpful for you to hear. So I call it a tribute to partnership in poetry and it's a largely autobiographical message with my experience over the last 50 years. I say 50 years, um, I suppose it could have been longer but When I was in the 11th grade is when I came awake to things poetic. So I'm dating this from about 16 or 17 years old till today. My hope for you in these few minutes is that you will be awakened to see God's world and God's word with clearer and more attentive eyes and with a heart more in tune with God's design for your affections. It's very clear to me that God does intend for you to see the world with the eyes of a poet, or at least with the eyes of one who has the heart of a poet. And I say that because of what I see in Psalm 19, which is a poem In the Bible, God put poetry in his word, and then in that poetry, he pointed to the poetry of the world. So, let me give you an example of why I think God intends you to see the world through the eyes of a poet, namely your eyes. Verses 4 and 5. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. So two lines, depending on how you divide them, from a poem in the Bible about the sun. How are you supposed to see the sun coming up I just love the rhythm of the year. We meet for prayer in that little nook over there every Tuesday and Friday, and we meet every Tuesday and Friday of the year, which means some some of those Sundays, some of those days, the sun is coming up right over there, and in in a few months, it'll be coming up right over there, and and we just watch it move down the horizon as it rises, and the earth does its tilt. How are you supposed to see it rising, and then? moving in its blazing brightness across the sky. What, what are you supposed to see and feel? Or are you supposed to feel anything? Does feeling matter at all when you look at the sun? Here's poetry in verses 4 and 5 of Psalm 19. There's Hebrew parallelism, of course. There's metaphor, of course. If you read it in the Hebrew, there's clear assonance. I tried to just say it over and over again this morning, see if I could hear it. I'm not an expert in Hebrew pronunciation, but I, I think I can get close enough to hear something of what they would have heard in the consonants of the repetition of certain words. Here's a statement on the meaning of the rising sun in poetic language. The rising of the sun means joyful expectancy like that of a bridegroom coming out of his tent heading for his wedding. 
That's what you're supposed to feel something of when you look at a sunrise. Joyful expectancy of a bridegroom coming out of his tent, heading for his wedding. And as you watch it move through the day with its blazing brightness and you can't even look at it, it is so powerful, you are supposed to see a strong man running a race with joy. Eric Liddell, head cocked back, feeling the pleasure of God. That's what you're supposed to see. That's what you're supposed to feel. Something like that. A bridegroom with expectant joy coming out of his tent. Cannot wait to meet this woman. And uh, a strong man loving to run across the sky. and Head cocked back and delighting in every step he takes. That's what you're supposed to see. Something like that is supposed to be happening in here. That's why God put the sun where he put it, according to Psalm 19. So it's a poem using language to help us see the world with the eyes of a poet. The beauty of the rising sun, the blazing of the brightness of the sun all day long. This is God's revelation of exuberant joy, His joy, telling us something about what He thinks, what He feels as He makes and sustains the world. So that's what I've been trying to do for 50 years with the help of poetry. And I, I'm saying it's in the Bible that way, and therefore it's totally warranted to use poetry to see the world and to savor the world and to speak the world, because that's what God does in the Word. So let me give you a definition of poetry. This is what I'm working with. And I didn't get this out of any book at all. I made this totally up out of my own head and uh, have no idea whether professional poets would like it. But here's my definition. An effort to awaken or intensify and usually to share a moving experience by using language that is chosen and structured differently from ordinary prose. That's my definition. A couple of comments about it. It's a, it's a use or a stewarding of the God gift of language. This is a precious gift. Language is a precious gift, and it can be stewarded very badly. It's being used badly all the time. Your generation uses it very badly, and so does mine. And I, I read bad stewarding of language, and I want to say, it's not, we, we don't exist for that. We don't exist for that at BCS and Bethlehem. We can do better than stuff. Stuff. I don't want the word stuff to be used anymore. Strike the word stuff, especially when combined with the word divine or something like that. It's a stewarding of a gift. Number two, it's the choosing of language. The poet doesn't just say it. He, he thinks and he works. Mark Twain said the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. Just the almost right word, bug. Right word, bah! And so poets try, try to find the word. That's what I mean by choosing. And then they structure it differently. They put it in lines, and they think about meter sometimes, and they think about rhyme sometimes, and they think about paragraph breaks sometimes, and indentations and capitalizations, and they move things around, trying in some way to help the person get in with the experience. Which means, by the way, that there's a very blurry line between prose and poetry. There's a lot of prose that if you just broke it into lines would be better than a lot of poetry. And there's a lot of poetry that if you just spread it out and took the line breaks away would be bad prose. 
which means, by the way, for the sim folks, that there's a very blurry line between preaching and poetry. But that's not in my manuscript. Talk about that later in the class, maybe. The, the essence of the definition is the poet has been moved by an experience. It could be anything. Today is my daughter's 17th birthday. I always write poems for my family. Anniversaries, birthdays, Thanksgiving, Valentine's Day. I'm looking for reasons to write poems for Noel. I've written more poems for Noel than everything else combined in 44 years. So I wrote a poem for Noel, for, for Talitha last night about a stolen bicycle and my intention to replace it. Anything, just anything. God, give me eyes. Give me eyes to see something precious and powerful and deep and you in it. Help me see. And that's what poetry does for me. So a moving experience has been experienced. And then you try to somehow capture it, awaken it, intensify it, and sometimes share it. So Wordsworth says poetry is emotion recollected in tranquility. Recollected. You don't write, you don't write the poem during sex while the bike is being stolen, while you're enjoying the sun set. Job was not written while he had boils, but later in poetry. So, definition, an effort to awaken or intensify and usually to share a moving experience by using language that is chosen and structured differently from ordinary prose. Now, in that definition is a word that will help you see, I think, why poetry has become so pervasively present in the 50 years of my life because that word links it to my philosophy of life, namely Christian hedonism. And the word is simply moving. It's a moving experience. If you weren't moved, you wouldn't bother to write anything down. You wouldn't even bother remembering it if you weren't moved in some way. And I mean negatively, like horror or dread can be one of the movings or joy can be another of the movings. Being moved in our affections, not just informed in our reason, goes to the heart of the universe. That is the heart of God. And his purposes for the world. Let me get at this now for a minute. By going to my journal from two years ago, this is December 5th, 2010, I said to Noel last night as we were going to sleep, and I was holding in my hand the collection of the final poems just published by Harold Bloom called Till I End My Song. Is there anything in your life, Noel, like this? I have loved poetry since I was in the 11th grade. Moved to read it, loved to write it. I have drifted from it for seasons, but returned again and again, often more passionate about it than before. This amazes me. I have changed so much between the age of 17 and 65, 7, 6. But this remains. I love to write. Not bare factual or bare argument, though I believe in facts and arguments. They are essential. But I want to be moved when I read. I want to move people when I write. I want deep parts of them to be awakened to the greatest realities. I don't want to merely impart information or get information. I want to feel, not with the body, but with the soul, the wonder or the horror or the glory of things of God. In my life... Poetry is so interwoven with the emergence of Christian hedonism that it's inescapably a part of my life. Christian hedonism says 
Being moved spiritually is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. I speak carefully. What makes a Christian is that the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to awaken souls, dead souls, to the surpassing preciousness of the beauty of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's what happens when you become a Christian. You were dead, then you were awakened through the word by the Spirit, and what that awakened soul sees is the preciousness of the gospel, the preciousness of Jesus, the preciousness of God and of the Holy Spirit and the way of salvation and a thousand fruits flowing in the Bible. That's what it means to become a Christian, to be awakened to preciousness. You feel this is precious. I will die for this. The essence of being a Christian is being moved in your soul, not tingles in your palms or wobbly in your knees. Natural things can do that, but only the Holy Spirit can awaken the soul for God. And when you're awakened, you see beauty for what it really is, spiritual affections are born. Christ becomes your supreme treasure, and you are moved by his infinite value, his beauty, his greatness, and all that God is for us in Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. God creates Christians to fulfill his highest purpose, namely, glorifying his grace by enjoying it. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him, is the banner flying over my life. It gives coherence to everything I do, and poetry has been the instrument of God right at the thick of it, giving me eyes to see what is there and savor what is there and speak what is there. It has been an amazing gift. So being moved by what we see is not marginal It's what we were created for. It's the way God is in his Trinitarian life. Know this, you're at BCS. God is moved when he looks at his son. He loves him infinitely. The son is moved when he looks at the father's glory and he feels and loves him infinitely. And the holy, holy, holy spirit Spirit is the embodiment of that being moved and carries it all in himself, is the being moved of the Father and of the Son in you when you are possessed of the Holy Spirit. This is huge. Do you see how central all this is, how it all fits together, Trinitarian fullness and Christian hedonism and the function of a little simple thing that we used on that screen for three songs called Poetry. Amazing. So my life is just interwoven with Christian hedonism and and poetry as a way of seeing and awakening and intensifying these moving experiences of God's works and God's word. So that's what poetry is for, to clear those eyes and admit to the soul light that will move you because it helps you see what is really, really there. So poetry is not a marginal aesthetic experience for me. I mean, people, people talk about poetry. Well, they never talk about poetry. Nobody buys it hardly. But the few people who do, they, they say, well, that's just a nice, that's nice for nursery rhymes and the braggy king of Babylon and and it's, uh, you can see how different it is for me. It's a way of seeing. It's a way of awakening. It's a way of being moved. It's a way of speaking as a pastor. So come at it from this angle. As a pastor, I dare not let my soul die. 
die to glory, die to beauty, die to wonder in the Bible, in the gospel, in the way of salvation, in the creation. I, I dare not. If I languish, if I cease to see glory, if I cease to feel glory, be moved by glory, my people begin to die. That's the function of this pulpit. Life rises and falls in a church in large measure by the life and the eyes, the seeing and the savoring and the saying of the pulpit, of the glory, of the works of God. I don't have the privilege to let myself die like Charles Darwin did. Listen to this. This is Darwin, very famous quote. You may have read it. Up to the age of 30 or beyond, poetry of many kinds gave me great pleasure. And even as a schoolboy, I took intense delight in Shakespeare. Formerly, pictures gave me considerable and music very great delight. But now, for many years, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I've tried to read Shakespeare and found it intolerably dull so that it nauseated me. I have also almost lost any taste for pictures or music. I retain some taste for fine scenery, but it does not cause me the exquisite delight which it formerly did. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding out general laws out of large collections of facts. But why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone for which the higher tastes depend, I cannot conceive. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to the intellect and more probably to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. I cannot let that happen. And you dare not let that happen. And God has given us, among many other means, poetry as a help. So Jonathan Edwards argues that the explanation for the fact that there exists such a thing as music and verse or poetry in the Bible and outside, is precisely this. So I'll read you this quote from Edwards. The duty of singing praises to God seems to be appointed wholly to excite and express religious affections. So to awaken and speak, being moved. No other reason can be assigned why we should express ourselves in verse, poetry, rather than prose, and do it with music, but only that such is our nature and frame that these things have a tendency to move our affections. So, he argues, the reason the Bible is up to one-third poetry and the reason the Bible continually says sing to the Lord is that God has so constituted our natures that the musical dimension of the expression and the versification or poetic dimension of the expression are designed by God to quicken and express affections. So God puts a huge premium on the affections since he designed so much of the Bible to quicken and express them. Now, this is BCS Chapel, and therefore, I am going to create a problem and then struggle to solve it with not great confidence that I succeed. So here we go. Here's the problem. I just read to you quote from Jonathan Edwards that the reason God has appointed verse and music is that they awaken affection. Listen to what he says about his preaching. 
I should think it myself, think myself in the way of my duty to raise the affections of my hearers as high as I possibly can, provided that they are affected with nothing but truth. And with the affections that are not disagreeable to the nature of what they are affected with. So on the face of it, I cannot explain why he would say that and say, verse, that is the form of language, and music, a nonverbal vehicle for carrying that verse, is designed by God to awaken the affections and then say, I only want to awaken affections by truth. So I have spent some hours thinking about that. I don't think Edwards is careless. He may have been, just slipped. And he shouldn't have said one or the other or should have qualified one. And I wish he were here. Jonathan, would you please explain how those two fit together? And he's not here, and so uh, here's my effort to make them fit together. Maybe he wasn't careless, maybe there's a deeper coherence in what he meant. And I'm going to start with 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 and 5. In case you haven't recognized it yet, we're working very much in the orbit of Joe Rigney's sermon from two Sundays ago. I have Joe looking over my shoulder as I write, (laughs) which I am happy for. So, Joe loves this text and... 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5 is addressed to people who are forbidding marriage and food because marriage and food are too natural and physical for holy people like us. And Paul responds that that's the teaching of demons and says that everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is to be received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So they forbid marriage and and food, and I'm saying somebody might forbid poetry and music. I'm just replacing poetry and music with sex and and food and seeing if the application will help me make sense out of Jonathan Edwards' seeming contradiction. So you get food, sex, poetry, music, all of them natural, nothing spiritual about them because natural people with no Holy Spirit can make them and enjoy them and therefore they're not in themselves spiritual, the way that Paul uses the word spiritual. But they can be sanctified, made holy by the Word of God and prayer, which means something like this for music and poetry, I would suggest. Music and poetry can be transformed into holy movers of the affections, holy movers of the affections, when they are so united to the truth of the Word that the affections raised by both, the poetry and the music over here and the Word and the truth over here, are indistinguishable. Say it a different way. The truth... And the music and the verse, versification, those two art forms, are so wed, so interwoven with each other that when the emotions rise on the basis of them, no distinction can be made among those three where the emotions is coming from. I've experienced that here hundreds of times in in worship. I have sometimes checked out, you know, if you're self-conscious, you're not worshiping, but it happens. Sometimes you do it intentionally. So I'm checking out, I'm watching John Piper. Holy, 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 and asking, why are you liking this? Is it the piano? Is it Chuck? Is it the team? Is it the atmosphere? Is it the truth? Is it the tune? Is it, and as best, in my best moments, as I can say is, that's a question that won't be admitted right here. God has done something so that the tune, the truth, and the form of the truth called poetry have been blended 
so that there's rising in my heart an affection that Edwards would say is coming from truth and is awakened by the blended, woven verse and music. That's my best effort to make sense out of Edwards and my own experience. The point of all that is to drive home that poetry is a way of seeing, a way of awakening, and a way of being moved. And it would be good to underline the importance of that function of poetry by simply saying again, the Bible is up to a third poetry. And not only poetry, but elements of alliteration, assonance, cadence, chiasm, consonance, metaphor, onomatopoeia, paradox, parallelism, rhyme, simile, etc. all over the Bible, poet or no poet, they are there and they are clearly inspired to have an effect on us in some proper way. So we are driven to ask how truth and form unite to have a proper holy effect. Not only is it modeling poetry for us, but it says things like this, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. So it uses a poetic analogy there, like apples of gold in a setting of silver is a word fitly spoken. Just the right word, in the right way, in the right time, and it does its apples of gold in a setting of silver work. So it tells us to look for that moment and that word and pray that God would give you the gift to do that. So you go to visit like I did on yesterday, was it? Maybe the day before I went to visit the family, the Aherns, who just lost their 20-year-old son. He didn't wake up. Tuesday morning, and so I, I don't even know this family closely. I just have sons. So I drive over there, knock on the door, and when I see them, I say, oh, sure, I've seen these folks. I know who these people are. Like, I'm a tra- pastor of this 5,000-person church. I don't know everybody, but I'm walking in there, and you know what I'm praying? God, give me words. They gotta be true. That's the number one thing. They gotta relate to the gospel. They gotta relate to hope. But may they land with just precious sweetness and power and comforting, sustaining, Christ exalting, God honoring, hope giving grace. That's that's what we're talking about here. This is not an aesthetic game. This is life and death. The preacher sought to find words of life. Words of delight, misread it. Ecclesiastes 12, 12, 12, 10. The preacher sought to find words of delight. So, 50 years, poetry has been a part of my life. Reading it, writing it, being awakened, intensified by both reading and writing. It's a way of seeing, it's a way of savoring, it's a way of saying to others what I have experienced in the hope that they might share the experience and even go beyond me and deeper in the very experience by something I say. It's it's in the heart of the Trinity. The Trinity is all constituted by the way the Father and the Son take delight in each other, are moved by each other, and then spill over in words and revelation and creation for us to share in, in that. At the heart of reality, created and uncreated, is seeing what is really there and savoring what it's really worth. At the heart of reality, created and uncreated, is seeing what is really there, savoring it for what it's really worth. And that's what poetry has done for me all these years George Herbert says it so well. This is what I want to experience and be in God's calling. And he wrote a poem called Providence, and here are four lines. Of all the creatures both in sea and land, only to man thou hast made known thy ways, and put the pen alone into his hand, and made him secretary 
of thy praise. I love that phrase. Only man of all the animals have you made secretary of your praise. And when I read it, I just say, yes, that's what I want to be. I want to speak as your secretary and write as your secretary and awaken and express your praise. That's what I'm on the planet for. When I was flying home, and I'll, I'll stop with this, my time's up. I, I, when I was flying home from the Grand Canyon this summer, um, I watched Act of Valor. And it's about the Navy SEALs rescuing one of their comrades and horrible. I wrote, here's what I put in my journal. I wrote, riveting, risk. War, family, friendship, sacrifice, obedience, love, courage, horror, dread, wickedness, endurance, death, grief, grief, aching, grief. And the movie ends, remember, with the widow's hand on the American flag, slight music, and a poem by an American Indian named Tecumseh being read and the movie's over and as I was watching it you know you watch these action films and you just go <laughs> can anything as soft and simple as poetry have any real relationship to the horrors of war and when they reached for a way to capture the climax of the emotion of the film, what did they reach for? A poem. That's worth thinking about. Poetry is not the answer of the world's suffering and misery. Jesus is. But poetry is more relevant for the world's suffering and misery than 95% of what we do with our leisure. Let's pray. So, Father in heaven, I, I thank you for the gift of poetry. More than that, I thank you for something to see, something to savor, something to speak, namely, yourself your way of salvation, your son. I pray that these students would so experience the clearing of their eyes that they would see with the eyes of a poet. They don't need to become writers of poetry, but oh, that they might see and savor and speak the wonders of your works. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.